Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Venom Vlog, and today we are going to talk about Maximum Venom, Episode 3 from Marvel Spider-Man. This is called Vengeance of Venom. Uh, the first half was written by Zach Crayley, and the second half was written by legendary comic book writer J.M. Demetrius. And if you haven't checked out my interview with him, luckily I had the pleasure to do that. That was in a previous episode, so I'll put the link down below if you haven't seen it yet. It was actually the episode before this one for Venom Vlog, so make sure you go check it out, Episode 523. And uh, it was awesome. It was a real pleasure talking to him. I've been a fan of his for years, and, uh, and you know, I got to thank uh, Kevin Burke and uh, Chris Doc Wyatt, who I interviewed last week. Uh, before episode three aired and, uh, and they, you know they're the head writers of the show they're creative producers on the show and they were nice enough to set that up for me and i really am very grateful uh to talk to someone i've admired for so long so please go check that episode out and uh, and you can hear a little bit more about my thoughts of this episode in my interview with Jam Demetrius. So uh, yeah, check it out for me. And then uh, also, you know, for this episode, I know some of you have been waiting for it. I, you know, what I'm going to do is typically give it like a week. So, you know, uh, when the episode airs for Maximum Venom, I'll probably wait till the following Sunday to put my reviews up. Just those of you who wonder, uh, because I saw, you know, a couple comments being like, you know, hey man, where's that review? Where's that review? And it's like, hey, be patient. I work on other things too. And pretty soon I'll be having a job coming up. Luckily, I was able to find one uh, here in Florida. And uh, hopefully it stays open. Uh, I'll be working at SeaWorld, so I'm very excited about that. And, uh, you know, I'll talk about that on a Seek and Destroy episode or something later on. Uh, but you guys are here for, you know, Maximum Venom episode 3, Vengeance of Venom, and you want to know my thoughts. And so that's what I'm going to hear. You know, I'm here to bring to you today are those thoughts. So we're going to start with uh, the beginning of the episode, which I'll be honest with you. Although I felt like this episode was pretty good as far as pacing goes, I felt like there was also problems with the pacing as well you know so I, I do have some criticism of this episode um and i have some oh, maybe a few fan concerns you know i'm still interested i still kind of like where it's going and i think because of some of my concerns it, it prevents me from predicting where the show's going so i would say even in my critiques i'm still intrigued by the show and where it could go from here and that is you know that keeps me going you know that's like all right well i guess because i can't figure out what's probably going to happen in the next episode uh that's incentive to watch it, you know? So uh, so I gotta give them credit that even though I have kind of fanboy critiques on it, um, I also have some constructive critiques as a critic, uh, but then I feel like both of those even still make me want to keep watching. So obviously all the things I'm gonna critique are probably intentional, uh, you know, from the, the creators and writers of these shows. Uh, so they're doing their jobs in because at the end of this episode, I was like, where are they gonna go from here? And, uh, and that's, I guess that's a good thing. So, so, uh, so yeah, because it's like now I want I want the next episode now. I don't want to wait another month for it. So uh, so yeah, it's kind of pretty effective that way. So we'll start with um, you know some of my f positives, I guess. You know, I, I really loved um, you know the the moments with Peter Parker kind of you know up against the odds. I mean, that's pretty much I think what this two episodes do really really well is they really stack the odds against Peter Parker. I mean, he starts off and it just goes you know this is the invasion episode this is the one that we they built up in the first episode and that i was kind of hoping we get in the second episode but that you know they were like oh let's you know show the story where peter parker kind of becomes a leader and then this episode you kind of see him be that leader the downside is though is i feel like a good leader he's kind of a chris redfield leader <laughs> you know uh post resident evil 5 and if you don't know what i mean by that because uh, it's a resident evil reference um every time they write a chris redfield story they uh, they make him the leader of a group and he leads the group in and everybody but Chris dies, <laughs> typically, or maybe one other person might survive with him. But it's typically, you know, him leading a group in and they all get wiped out. And in five, it was just him escaping with Sheva. And in six, you know, he escaped with some of the other main characters you play as, uh, like Leon and stuff. Um, but then in like the, the movie uh, Vendetta, like he leads a whole team in, they get wiped out. And in Resident Evil 7, he leads the whole team and get wiped out. So that's what it was. It was like, oh, Spider-Man's the leader, but one by one, his team gets wiped out. And you're like, oh, man. And it's cool because Peter does actually show leadership skills. He does try to stay one step ahead of the symbiotes. But unfortunately, they do have a lot of knowledge as well. And they're bonding with people like Tony Stark and stuff. So they are. it's easy for them to stay ahead of Spider-Man. So every time you think Spider-Man's one step ahead because he's a smart, capable person and he's working with people who are also smart like Riri Williams, uh, he starts figuring out like, oh, she says something about communication and he's like, hey, that reminds me, the seed. That's probably what Venom, I thought he was using it to like wipe out the earth, but maybe that was something that sent a beacon to space to bring the other aliens here. 
So I thought that was cool. I was like, all right, this, that's great. Like that's a, that's great dot connecting for Peter Parker. It shows that he's smart and he has logic and he's using that to try to stay ahead of the enemies. Uh, but then every time he gets ahead, you're like, hey, we got to go get Cloak and Dagger, which was cool because they had the actual voice actors from the live action TV show come back and reprise their roles as Cloak and Dagger, which was pretty neat. And, uh, and so he was like, let's go get them because Cloak can actually open himself up to a portal to another dimension and maybe we can just send all the symbiotes there. And I'm like, hey, that's a great plan. And then they go and the symbiotes are one step ahead because like I said, they bonded with Tony Stark and the other Avengers and they come to Earth and they're like a small ship and they attack, you know, uh, Miles and Peter and everybody and uh, start taking everybody out one by one. And only Peter and Riri would get away. Uh, but then also, you know, um, uh, Miles gets away uh, too as well. He gets knocked off the building and they're like, what happened to him? But luckily he shows up later to, you know, help out and save the day uh, for a minute. <laughs> then he gets taken over again. So, um, so I did like that as far as like a okay, uh, we can't really give your characters a moment to breathe. So we got to have this and this and this. And it's like, and Riri gets, uh, you know, possessed, you know, or taken over by a symbiote. And then uh, Miles gets taken over. And then the Hobgoblin shows up and he gets taken over. Cloak and Dagger get taken over. Um, Aranya, uh, you know, she gets taken over. And it was like, all right, cool. It's like, they did a really good job of like, here, here's some help. Boom, take them down. And I thought that was probably one of the strengths of the episode. That and the actual characterization of Moon Knight. Now, I know it's a kid's cartoon, so they couldn't go, you know, schizophrenic with them. They couldn't do a guy with mental health issues and they couldn't really dive into the psychology of that. Uh, it makes sense because it's, you know, it's a show for kids and uh, it's better to just have a guy who is struggling with something. Uh, he is trying to um, overcome the death of somebody he loved. And because of that, he's been unable to uh, be motivated and inspired to continue to be Moon Knight. So he is an older guy. He knows who Spider-Man is when they meet up and he's like, look, kid. I knew who you are. I just figured you had access to Avengers technology so I can hack into something, grab some, uh, you know, supplies from a, a Tony Stark base nearby and get food and supplies. And then I'm just going to hide out in the sewers and I'm just going to wait for this invasion to roll through Earth and go on to the next planet. And then Spider-Man's like, yeah, but what if they stay? And he's like, well, then I'll stay underground forever until I die. Um, and Peter doesn't like that, you know, and they get into it. And Peter says, you know, you have power. He finds out that, you know, Mark Spector, this guy who's helping him out, finds out he's Moon Knight. And he's like, wait, no, you're Moon Knight. And he's like, yeah. And he goes, but I, I know who Moon Knight is. Moon Knight was a superhero. Why? But you're not very heroic. And he's like, yeah, because I lost somebody. And Peter's like, well, I lost somebody too. And that was my uncle. And he told me with great power comes great responsibility. And Moon Knight's like, yeah, well, your uncle's a moron and he's a fool. And and Peter's like, take that back, you know? And, uh, and so, you know, there's some tension there between them. And, you know, you have this idealistic kid who's very hopeful and you have this old bitter curmudgeon dude who's kind of given up in a way. And uh, although he does have a spark of hope still in him, and you'll see Peter right in this moment kind of laid the breadcrumbs or the seed for that uh, that hope to kind of blossom out later on. And so I kind of like how that was done. So these are all things that I really liked in this episode. I thought they were really strong, uh, the strongest aspects of it. Uh, but I did have some critiques as far as like, uh, one thing they, they kind of teach you when in writing and storytelling and stuff, um, is, uh, is is character placement where people are at certain times you know and there's a lot going on in this episode and i feel like characters get lost in the shuffle like um for example tony stark when he shows up at uh you know avengers tower and he's taken over by a symbiote spider-man actually pulls this um tube that's connected to the arc reactor so it's electrical and he's shoving it into uh, venom iron man and it's temporarily separates the the symbiote suit from iron man uh but then iron man like passes out or the suit he, they just kind of fall off screen defeated i guess but then you never see them again until the end when iron man shows back up still possessed in the final battle and then peter saves them and then at the end He's standing there with Riri and everyone and Doctor Strange gets the final words to Spider-Man and Iron Man doesn't. Almost like the voice actor wasn't available or something. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that's not the case, but I mean, I'm sure it was structured that way. It had to be that way, but it just felt like, oh, okay. Like, so Iron Man just, we see Spider-Man kind of get the one up on him and there's not even a line where Iron Man's like, hey, good job, kid. You know, thanks for electrocuting me with my own arc reactor. You know, nothing like that. Like, I just to have some kind of mention of it and closure of it. Um, so yeah, so he just kind of falls off screen and in the same space, uh, Grady's there, Grady from, uh, you know, Horizon Labs and, uh, and he, or Horizon High or whatever it's called on the show. And he, he shows up to help Spider-Man with the seed and Spider-Man's like calling him like, Hey, Grady, Spider-Man, you know, it's Peter, Spider-Man's coming over. He needs you to find this seed in, in the office of Max Modell or whatever. And so Grady's like, all right, cool. I'll help you. And so Grady helps. And then 
You don't know what happens to Grady. He's literally in the scene and then the attack happens and then Grady goes, oh no. And he like, you know, hides behind a desk or something. And then you never see him again, you know, <laughs> until the very end. I think he's with the group of people at the very end. Um, but yeah, he just kind of dipped off screen. And so I felt like they were losing track of some of their characters. And while that's not a major thing, I feel like most kids watching the show won't notice it. But for me, you know, who likes to know where people are at all times, it's, it, it is kind of distracting because I was sitting there going, well, is Tony now free of the symbiote? And does that mean he'll come back at the end and help Peter out in the final battle? Um, or is Grady, you know, is he going to find a way to like slip around and get back to, the, you know, in the final battle? Um, yeah, they just kind of disappear. It was like, all right, those characters are done. They, they serve their two second purpose and, and that's it. Um, so that was interesting. And then as far as like a fan critique, I guess, it's more of a question, but I'm kind of confused how the symbiotes are uh you know taking over people because at first it's just like four symbiotes it's like iron man and uh you know cup weather avengers thor and stuff like that and they show up in their ship i think captain marvel's there and they show up and they're just possessed by symbiotes but they're not covered head to toe so i'm like okay that's you know that fits the designs and drawings we saw but i guess i kind of thought the final designs for the show would be them covered head to toe in some way um, like fully venomized, but but I was like, okay, man, you want to show off who these characters are, you know, get, get glimpse of them, I guess, whatever. I go, so, okay, fine. And they have Groot there. Um, again, Groot just disappears, and then he pops up later on, Max Modell has him, and he's like, yeah, I lured him over with ice cream. And it's like, okay, well, like, I, <laughs> I guess that happened. Like, uh, so, um, so, yeah, it was just like, I don't know just things kept happening where it was like this character we who cares what happened to them oh okay we'll just bring him back over here and it just seemed kind of like all over the place in that regard uh but like i said my question is how the how the symbiotes are doing this because they'll have iron man and he'll grab you know riri williams or something and then his symbiote will come off and go on to her but then he's still a symbiote and then now she's a symbiote and i'm like uh okay like so these four symbiotes came to earth but somehow they can reproduce. And then they're also, they're, they're like the, 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 the first wave. They're coming in to, I guess, possess all the, the remaining heroes that are left on Earth. So that way it's an easy invasion. So there's like a big mothership in the sky, which kind of looks like a whale, uh, but it's a ship and it's got symbiote on it on you know i thought i was like that'd be cool if it's just like a space whale like in rebels like star wars rebels if it was just like a space whale it wasn't even a spaceship it was just like a living creature and they just you know all the symbiotes went on it to you know to bond with it to, to help navigate it through space that would have been really cool <laughs> but instead it was like a weird spaceship that looked like a whale so i don't know if that's like from a guardians of the galaxy cartoon or a previous design we've seen or something like that like uh, you know it, it didn't ring out to me uh, it just remind me of those things from rebels um but there's like a thousand symbiotes on it and it's coming to earth so we have this scout team basically almost like venom was in the movie where it was like all right let's send riot and venom and scream and all these you know these four symbiotes down to earth that's what this felt like so i'm like okay but then yet they could reproduce themselves and cover somebody else and make them a, a fully controlled symbiote um and then they do the same thing to dr strange they take him over and then they decide okay well you know what he's got unique powers and he's got the time gem so let's just, he's going to be the ringleader now. So then once the suit, you know, once it went from Iron Man to Riri and then to, you know, to Doctor Strange, Doctor Strange kind of became the de facto leader because the symbiotes were like, oh, we like this, you know, magic stuff or whatever. And so I was like, all right, that's, that's kind of neat. I like that. But again, how, like, how did the suit split in half? Like, are they just... Uh, did they send four suits that are in heat <laughs> who are just reproducing um because obviously we know symbiotes do reproduce but it was just like it was so fast that i was like how are they doing this how are they uh how are they you know having this control um and then you know they so they so spider-man is like you know they get all of his teams getting taken down one by one they're getting turned into symbiotes and then at the end it's pretty much like uh you know uh aunt may at the very beginning of the episode peter gives aunt may a weapon that he got from uh from horizon he says please use this in case uh you know there's an actual alien invasion coming i can't tell you how i know this but you know i learned it from horizon but this thing will protect you please stay safe so aunt may actually gets a cool story arc in this because she does start she actually helps out in fighting in the alien invasion she finds some kids from their neighborhood um and which was a bummer because i was like oh that's a great place that they could have put mary jane in she could have been one of the kids in the neighborhood that aunt may met up with and they fought their way to downtown where they find peter um or spider-man 
and uh, and that's where they find Moon Knight. And Aunt May has this moment with Moon Knight after he's separated from Peter, and he's about to get taken over by symbiotes. And uh, and Aunt May finds him and saves him because the weapon she has is like a vibration laser gun kind of thing. So it kind of wipes out the symbiotes or it weakens them enough. And they were able to save Mark Spector. And he has this moment where he looks at Aunt May and she say, he's like, thanks for saving me. And she goes, oh, well, you know, my uh, my husband would have wanted me to do that. You know, he was a good man. And he's like, oh, yeah. And he goes, what was your husband like? And he goes, well, he used to say this thing all the time with great power comes great responsibility. And so I'm out here with this power, with this weapon, looking for my nephew. And that's when Mark Spector make, connects the dots like, oh, man, your nephew is Spider-Man. And he said the same thing to me earlier. And I made fun of him and called your husband a fool in a way. And he goes, but that was the the thing that, you know, like I said, it was the seed that you know Peter planted. And now it's blossomed because of Aunt May repeating the words to, to Mark Spector. And it was kind of like one of those miracle moments where you're just like, what are the odds that I, I met that kid and he's actually the nephew of this woman and she's repeating the same message the kid did earlier. Um, it makes Mark step up and become Moon Knight again. So that stuff I did like. I liked the Aunt May stuff. I liked the Mark Spector stuff. And I liked him coming in at the end of the day, you know, helping out and saving, you know, help save the day. Uh, and they give like the, uh, the weapon that Aunt May has to Max Modell. And him and uh, Spider-Man work on it together and create an anti-venom device, which uh, they, you know, they captured Groot. Like I said earlier, Max Modell lured Groot in with ice cream. You know, good thing he did that because Groot has these spore abilities where he can, you know, release spores into the air. And uh, they can, now that they've reversed his symbiote into an anti-venom symbiote, uh, now when he releases the spores, um, they will cure all, they, they basically kill and eradicate completely all the symbiotes. So that big mothership, it does end up coming into Earth's atmosphere. It lands in New York or it explodes and all the suits rain down. And it kind of reminded me of uh, Spider-Man 3, the uh, the Tobey Maguire movie, where, you know, remember Peter Parker and, and, and Mary Jane are just sitting in the park and like a little meteorite comes down and then off the meteorite is, you know, is uh, the symbiote. That's what this was. It was like all these little balls of fire, you know, were raining down on the city. And then from those were like little, you know, symbiotes and stuff. And I was like, all right, that's pretty cool. Like, that, I, I don't know if that was an intentional nod to Spider-Man 3 or not. But it was still kind of neat. I was like, all right, that's that's cool. But they all get wiped out at the end. And so it was like, is this show over? Like, there's three episodes left. And we have Anti-Venom Groot disappearing with Doctor Strange at the end. He's like, hey, we're going to go and, uh, you know, and we're going to save the Guardians of the Galaxy and the other heroes that are in space. So I'm going to guess that's not going to go as well as planned. Uh, and that's probably how they'll keep this story going for three more episodes. But um yeah, I did feel like there were some missed opportunities. I mean, obviously Mary Jane got that scene in the last episode, and then I was bummed that she was only used for that one scene. So just from a pacing standpoint for a season even, like, and I know this is an unconventional season because it's six one-hour episodes, but I just feel like, oh, man, I, I don't know. I, I feel like one of the kids from the neighborhood I would have had be Mary Jane, and that way Peter could have, as Spider-Man could have ran into her again. And, you know, I'm sure that's going to happen. I'm sure that's going to be something to develop, but... It just felt weird not having it in this episode a little bit. Um, so yeah, there there was uh, there was some like I said some critiques where I felt like they just had all these characters and then occasionally they just lose track of them and they just kind of move on. And then also the rules for the symbiote seem to not really have rules. Like I guess I guess symbiotes I can't ex really explain it if I but I'll win I'll be winning no prizes to do it. Where it's like oh maybe these four suits were ready to offspring and that's how they were able to take over these other beings and i think at one point when they take over cloak they're able to just teleport new symbiotes in with him or something because he takes a dagger absorbs her and then she comes out of him as a symbiote and i was like well th that also doesn't make any sense because there's no symbiotes in his pocket dimension but unless he opened a portal to the mothership and brought a symbiote you know what I'm saying? It's like it's and again, you're not supposed to read too much into that. Again, it's written for kids, so it has to happen quick and fast. Uh, but I feel like still you have to work out internal logic um, when you when you do these things. And so and there may be some and I just may be missing out on it. So to be fair to the you know the creators and writers of the show, um, it could just be one of those things where I missed it. I just happened to maybe they explained it in a, a line of dialogue. I did watch this episode two or three times, uh, two times and then third time, just a couple scenes just to kind of get, get them fresh in my head before doing this. But um, so maybe that it's possible I missed something where they try to explain some internal logic there. Um, or maybe there just isn't any. It's it's fine. Again, I'm not that doesn't count against the show. Those are more th that in particular is like a fanboy critique. Um, so that's not like a, a critic critique. A critic critique for me is more the pacing stuff and losing track of the characters. Uh, so that's what I would say like that. The one negative from a fanboy point is 
how do the symbiotes work in this episode or in this you know in this universe um and then the the critic part is losing track of characters and and kind of that interrupts the flow and the pacing of it i feel uh but there was a lot of good stuff in this episode too so to be fair um you know this was a, i think a stronger episode than the second episode um and i think it's because i really gravitated to the aunt may and mark specter stuff in the second half of this episode and i liked this the odds stacked against peter at the beginning of this episode because i really was starting to wonder if peter was going to get out of this and luckily you know aunt may you know inspired mark specter to get back into costume and that gave peter just the edge enough that he needed to help create anti-venom through groot who groot is now at the end going i am anti-venom you know which is kind of adorable and he looks great so hopefully we'll get a funko pop or toy of that because uh, that was pretty cool looking so anyway, those are my thoughts on this episode. You know, uh, you know, I try to obviously always be honest, be fair about things. And yeah, there were some things that bothered me and there were some things that didn't. Uh, but there was, uh, and there was, like I said, stuff I liked. But at the end of this episode, it was like, wow, this felt like it could have been a, a kind of a conclusion. Like Dr. Stream's like, hey, we're going to go to space and we're going to save the Guardians and, and take out, you know, the remaining symbiotes up there. And, and you guys are fine here. But there's three more episodes, three more hours left of this. And so I guess on a good note for me is like, where are they going to go from here? Because we, you know, they they say in this episode that Venom is killed. They straight up say that. They say that they want to possess everybody else on Earth, but not Spider-Man. They actually want to punish and kill Spider-Man after he loses all of his friends and loses all of humanity. They're saving him for last because it's personal to them. They're like, you made this personal. You killed Venom. And I was like, wait, so this show's called Maximum Venom? And Venom's dead? Like, they say it twice in this episode. So I don't know if they say it twice as, like, a, a like a, a MacGuffin. And not a MacGuffin, but, like, a, a curveball to make you think he is dead. And maybe we'll see, you know, something later. Or I don't know. And then, obviously, I'm, I'm wondering about Eddie. Like, we haven't really heard from Eddie in three episodes. We're halfway done with the season. So I'm just kind of like, what's happening? Like, is this episode, this season have been called Maximum Symbiotes? <laughs> uh, you know, it doesn't have a nice ring to it as Maximum Venom does, but... Um, I am. I'm, I'm concerned in one way as a fan, but I'm also intrigued because I'm like, hey, new ways to tell the story. We always talk about that, how alien invasion stories for symbiotes is just something that's been done numerous and numerous times. And I got to give them credit. At the end of this episode, I was like, I don't know where they're going to go next. I'm pretty good at predicting patterns and, and, and story points and where things could go. But I honestly and genuinely don't know where it could go next. And that's kind of exciting to me. So uh, I am obviously sticking in this. I'm going to review every episode of this show. I'll always be honest with you guys. Um, but let me know what you think. You know, did you do you agree with some of my critiques? Uh, do you disagree with some of my critiques? Uh, did you like this episode uh, as much as I did? Did you like it less? Did you like it more? You know, please comment down below. I would say if I was rating these out of, you know, five or something, the first episode I would have probably gave like, maybe like a two and a half to the first episode. Um, and then the second episode, I would have probably given a three. In this episode, I would have probably given a, a three and a, maybe somewhere between a three and a three and a half. Like it would, it's kind of fluctuating there. Um, so it is, I feel like gradually improving. And like I said, the stakes felt very high in this one. And some of the character moments were really good. There was a couple fanboy things I would have liked to seen done differently or explained. And there was a couple critiques I had, but overall I did enjoy this episode. And, uh, but I want to know what you think. So now that you've heard my thoughts, let me know yours down in the comments below. And as always, we'll continue our conversation down there. Thanks for watching the show. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And I'll see you guys in the next episode. Peace.